Welcome to a tasting of new Rita's Spring. Well, this really isn't a testimony show, so if you can kind of keep it brief. I mean, there's a ton of Christian shows you can call to present your testimony. I'd actually, you know, we're more interested in what you believe and why. Oh, okay, I can do that. Okay. Um, when I when I was younger, I really didn't know anything about God as a as a small uh, kid or anything like that. Like, I heard of Him, but nobody actually taught me anything about Him. And um, then one day. Because I was like a very uh, depressed teen, I didn't have any friends or anything. And what happened to me was, oh my God, okay, I got to turn the TV off. I'm looking at myself. <laughs> I'm sorry. You're looking um, at yourself on the TV. You're not even on TV. I meant my name. Oh. I'm hearing myself. <laughs> I uh, that was distracting me. Okay. Um, what happened to me was. I, I didn't, I, you know, I didn't really have anyone. My family didn't, wasn't really religious or anything. And then one day I was watching TV and there was this pastor on TV and uh, I, I wasn't really like paying attention to him because I didn't really understand what he was saying. But the only part I understood was God loves you and wants to get to know you. And... And me never having a, a father that, like, really spoke to me. So uh, there was this Bible that I found uh, and some totes and everything in my house, and I started reading it, and I'd ask my mom about the Bible, and she's like, I have no idea. That's not even mine. That's your grandmother's. And I'm like, okay. And I, and I had no one to, to tell me what the Bible meant. And so what happened to me was I spent – Every single day, reading the Bible, I was 14, reading the Bible all by myself. I had no one to teach me what the Bible meant. And every day I kept praying over and over and over for understanding of the Bible. And within two months, I learned a lot more than a bunch, than grown-ups do within two years of the Bible. Because I truly feel like the Holy Spirit was... Um, teaching me himself and you know I was you, too young. so first of all I, I i don't know how much grown-ups learn in two years uh <laughs> but um it That's wouldn't surprise me that somebody who spent a couple months reading the bible would know more about the bible than most people in church because most people in church don't spend that much time actually reading and studying their bible mm -hmm. okay mm -hmm. i um I mean, you, you do have a point and to to a certain extent, but I also believe that a teacher is also required to help you, uh, you know, understand okay. um, how things work. Yeah. The thing is, um, you're, you're still telling me what you believe, and I want to know why. Because first of all, I agree that being taught something is useful. Um, I also know that people can learn things on their own, certain things and certain skills, but at the end of the day, your argument is that you learned true things about the Bible and that this, the best explanation for that is that you had to have been taught. You couldn't have come to a correct understanding on your own. You believe it was the Holy Spirit who was teaching you? Since I had nobody else. So the first me. question I would ask is, how do you know that what you understand is correct? Well, two years after that, when I finally decided to go to church, um, I went to my very first youth class, and it was um, on the day that they were doing a, um, a review of everything they learned, like a recap, no, not a recap. Yeah, like 
where like they read the, their Bible for like the whole week, and then the next week after that, they do a review, review and say, what did you learn from this, and what did you learn from that? And I came in when he was asking questions, that when we were like, we weren't like actually reading the Bible. He had questions already up on the board, and I wasn't there when they were re- studying the Bible or, any- Bible or anything. So, and every and every time he asked a question, nobody but me would uh, answer them because they didn't know. And and he's and every single time he asked, I gave him the correct answer. How do you know the answer was correct? Because he told me. I was correct after. How do you know he was correct? Well, I would assume that since he is a youth leader and he's studying the Bible and he uh, knows what he's talking about is correct. I've been told by plenty of pastors and youth group leaders and friends and everything from church that I am wise beyond my years and I know a lot of stuff when no one's actually taught me. That's what I was told too. Yeah. Let me ask you this. Um, do you feel like you have a pretty commanding knowledge of the Bible? Um, about Jesus Christ and a couple of other things, yeah, mainly uh, the book of Revelations and the story of Jesus Christ. Okay. I Those are the two of them that I used to study growing up as a, as a kid. So you do, I, um, you do realize that the book of Revelation almost didn't even make the Bible because it makes no sense. I um I like I do um listen to uh Bart Earham, is that how you say his last name? Bart Ehrman. Yeah, him. And Mike Lacona. I, I they're really good historians. I like I like listening to both sides because I I um I used to question my faith too. I because I used to be like, I don't see God, I don't hear him. You know, things like that. If I, could, if I couldn't use my five senses, then he wasn't there. Right. You know, I used, I, used to, I used to believe that. Can I back you up? Let's let, Hang on. Let me back you up just a second. So okay. you, you know a little, some about Jesus, and you have studied the book of Revelation. But you realize that yes, no. the, the entire Jesus story is propped up on the notion of original sin, which begins back at Genesis, the first and second chapters. The entire Jesus narrative, the reason Jesus had to come to earth to die for the sins of humankind and and be the atonement for us, the sacrificial lamb, all of that is predicated upon the story in the Old Testament in Genesis, the most, arguably the most recognizable book in the most recognizable book in the world, Genesis. Who wrote the book of Genesis? Oh, Moses, I think it was. How do you know that? My knowledge is correct. <laughs> you mean like if because of the, the Bible says it or because that's... How do you know? Like you know Dr. Bart Ehrman wrote his books, right? Because he's there to verify authorship. There's a tremendous amount of documentation around the publication of that book that just lets us know for sure this is his material. How do you know Moses wrote the book of Genesis? How'd you get there? Well, I um, I use faith, and I've also listened to, because uh, historians, I mean, because there are billions of people on this planet that have died, and unless they had written documents about them, we wouldn't even know they existed. And like, um, like Moses. Like off topic. I mean, exactly. we have no evidence that Moses was even a real person. And, it, and I'm pretty much convinced that Moses wasn't a real person. It reads like a mythic hero. Mm-hmm. You know, the story of being cast aside in the water and then rescued from the water and raised in the, in the land that was oppressing his people and all this. I mean, it's a great, you know, narrative, but I have no reason to believe that it's true. And I believe no reason to believe that he wrote anything. Um, but even if, even if I knew for sure who wrote Genesis and I knew for sure it was Moses, um, what does that get me? And if you take it on faith that Moses wrote the book of Genesis, what if someone who believed in 
one of the hindu texts or who came to you about the koran and said they took the authorship of the koran on faith would you accept their faith as much as you accept your your own um there i used to uh, i used to uh, read about question. I don't mean to interrupt you, but if someone came to you with a faith claim... Alright, so you in here, you listening to this shit. How can Christianity say that all other religions are wrong? And that the God of the Bible, the Christian Bible, is the one true God. And every other God before or after is false. Like, how do Christians get to say that? How does any religion get to say that? Any religion with a creator God, how do they get to say, okay, this is the right way. This is the truth. And if you don't practice this truth, then you're a heretic. And you're wrong. When they can't, the, the Christian religion in the Christian Bible can't even prove itself is right and correct without errors but it's supposed to be the unfallible word of God which so many dubious mistakes throughout the book and it's like hmm so you want me to believe this book word for word really and then like this lady keeps saying, I didn't know him. And when I found him and he spoke to me, like, why do you make God a man? And he walked with Abraham and all this other stuff. Like, why is, why is God a man? Why isn't the feminine energy represented in the Holy Trinity? You have the father, the son, and the Holy Spirit. And it's like, okay, but we need women to procreate and make more life. So shouldn't she be a part of the Holy Trinity? But they're like, nah, fuck women. Women aren't important at all. And that's the one main thing. Like there are so many things that made me really, really question Christianity. And like they say, like most people don't study the Bible. You get the Bible read to you or preached to you. And that's all you know. What some do think was a good part. And he told you about the good part in the Bible that makes sense in his own interpretation. And even just from being preached to, like there are just like obvious, like the, the, the simplest questions like that. As a child, I ask the simplest questions. When uh, when God came to Abraham and he had his two angels, I'm like, so God just like was walking around? Like, but why does God have to walk? You know, <laughs> and it's like, oh, because he works in mysterious ways. And it's like, no, if you just question everything about the Bible, just like on a childlike level. <sighs> Because I question it ever since people said, ever since it was explained to me as a child, like when I could really understand shit, seven, eight years old and why we're going to church and, you know, what God is or who God is. And then they made you read all the Bible stories. And it's like none of that shit ever made sense to me ever. I always hated going to church like. It was so bad that by the time I was in middle school, like I had I had to go to church because my grandmother was the assistant pastor and I I live with my grandmother. She raised me. So church, you know, like not going to church wasn't an option. Grandma had to go to church because she's so involved in the church. She can't miss Sunday service. And so and you know in a, a regular southern baptist style the whole family gonna go to church and believe in god right. 
So we couldn't miss church. We couldn't just stay at home and watch fucking cartoons. My grandma wasn't having that shit. And so Bible study, Sunday school, motherfucking revivals and fairs. And man, I had to do all that shit. Gospel choir. Had to sing on the gospel choir and all that shit, man. And for some reason, bro. Like, that shit has never, ever felt right to me. Never in my entire life has that shit felt right or natural. Like, okay, this is cool. This is what we're supposed to do. Like, I've always rejected this system of whatever the fuck it is. And, and like, Southern Baptists, they shout and praise the Lord, get the Holy Ghost, and speak in tongues and all that shit. Yo, that shit always... I don't know, that shit always weirded me out. Like, that shit made me feel weird. Like, y'all know y'all crazy, right? You just sitting up here making a bunch of sounds. And you're saying that's God talking through you? And I asked my grandmother, and I said, so what What are you saying when you, when you speak like that? <laughs> like, once again, simple, childish questions. Okay, you're saying... Okay, we speak English and we can understand each other. But when the Holy Ghost hits you and you start gyrating and dancing around and then it gets so intense that you just just, you know, blabber out like sounds and you're saying you're speaking in tongues. And then I say, OK, so what are you saying? <laughs> and she's like. Well, you're not you, you can't understand it because it's the it's the the language of God. And so you're not meant to understand even what you're saying yourself and like, OK, that doesn't make sense. <laughs> How are you saying something, but you don't know what you're saying, but you're saying that your God is. Telling you to say this. Hmm. But then other times you can speak to God and pray and he'll answer your prayers or he'll guide you and, you know, give you messages and signs. But like when you when you speak in tongues, you don't supposed to be able to translate that. For another deity, prophet, holy book, religious, and they were just as convinced as you and they took it on faith. Would you give them as much credence as you give yourself in regard to Moses and the book of Genesis? This is going to sound kind of weird, but I would believe that they did have something, but it's not of God. I would say it's probably a demon line. Well, I might say know. that about you. I mean, how would you know that maybe you weren't hearing a demon in your yeah. head? So I, I have no reason to think that either of you are hearing a demon because I don't begin with the presumption that demons and gods are real. But... So, so you're you're making a claim, a faith-based claim, on behalf of your religion, and here's somebody else making a faith-based claim on behalf of another religion, and here's somebody else making a faith-based claim on behalf of another religion, and you're looking at it as, oh, I believe that they've got something, but it's a demon, and Seth and I are saying, faith is not a way to get to the truth. There is literally no position that one could hold that you couldn't base on faith. I, I could believe that I could believe that men are smarter than women, that white people are better than black people, that I could believe any of those things and when asked why I could say I just take it on faith. I just know. Well what I've done is I have watched um plenty of um documentaries of I've um like uh I know you I know you commented on this uh video of patterns of evidence and I yeah, I, I have a video about that. I I have um and then like when a uh, Bart says go through the uh the New Testament and look at all the different disciples how their certain things contradict each other and I will be the I mean I know you probably hear a lot of Christians say there are no contradictions in the Bible that's stupid of course there's contradictions in the Bible but there um. To me, they they um, kind of kind of like a, forget which ones, but and one of them it says Jesus when he was crucified they put a purple robe on him, and 
And the other one, it said they put a scarlet robe on him. That is a contradiction. Point being, it was a robe. They don't, you can't expect them to remember the exact same color, what it was. And there, throughout the Bible, you see things that do not add up. Some things are a big problem, and some things are very minor. I actually agree and with the last three sentences that you just said. There are a lot of things in the Bible that just don't add up. So, so we're back. We're back to the, we're back to the beginning. You are um, unfortunately a lonely, depressed fourteen-year-old. You discover the Bible. You spend a lot of time reading it. You find that you understand it. You find some comfort there. You wind up in church, and you find out that they've been uh, reading uh, reading it as well. And the guy asks questions, and you have the answers, and you're convinced that your answers are right because he tells you they're right because you guys are in agreement. So, for me, looking at that story. Um, I am certainly glad that you you found some sort of connection because that's important. Um, but what we have is a couple of people read a book and came away with a similar understanding of it. Now, this isn't remarkable at all. The bulk of Christianity, despite over the thousands of different denominations, the bulk of them agree on the bulk of it. It doesn't take some some grand teacher or spiritual wisdom, a good chunk of it is relatively face value. There's some things that are confusing and some things uh, where we can disagree about whether or not it's metaphorical or, or whatever. But that nothing about that is remarkable. Certainly not in, to the extent that you should consider it good reason to believe that it's true. I, um, I, I, I do, I, I understand where you're coming from. I, I'm not quite sure that you do, and I don't mean that insulting. I, let me see if I can clarify this. You mentioned Bart Ehrman and Mike Lacona. Now, I've been on stage with both of them, um, mm -hmm. and you talk about them both being good historians. Uh, I don't think that that's true. Mike Lacona doesn't understand skepticism, doesn't understand uh, evidence, and basically argues for the supernatural because somebody reported that a, a trash can lid moved across the room or you know they saw a ghost or they got money. Doesn't understand, yeah, you laughed. I, I did the debate with them on the resurrection and this is the case that he, he presented. Did you really say that? Yes, go, Google, Google my name and Mike Lacona and you can watch the entire debate. Now, that's not somebody who understands standards of evidence. However, what Mike or Bart has to say about this is irrelevant. The issue is you became convinced that there's a God for some reason, and I'm still trying to find out what that reason is so that I can figure out whether or not you have a good reason, and then maybe right. I can believe as well, or if you have a bad reason, and I can point out what the problem is. Because my, my, job, my job here is never to prove God doesn't exist. It's to address people's reasons and acknowledge if they're good or object if they're not. I, I can tell you, I'll tell you um, the reason why I do believe uh, God exists, so clear this up right now. <laughs> um, what I would, a um, little introduction, like I said before, I have doubted my faith and I didn't, you know, I didn't see God, so like that, I started to doubt him, it's hardship. But what happened one time was, there, this is the reason why I have undoubtable, shakable faith that God is real is because when I was in high school it, when I was in swimming class and it was a free day nobody you know they didn't have to swim they could do whatever they wanted and nobody was in the pool but me and I really couldn't swim and the pool was built weird the deeper the pool got the higher the edge got so when I, I could reach up touch the edge barely with my fingertips and I, I don't know if you ever heard of weird pool set or like that but mine that was. And um, I thought I'd, you know, be a little brave and try to swim in the deep end. <laughs> and um, it was, I started struggling and I said, help me. I wasn't like yelling it, but I was like saying it in a normal voice. And I thought people would come for me. The next thing I know, I'm under the water and I'm looking up at the surface as it's getting farther away. And I'm just like, it's like very surreal to me. I'm like, I'm going to drown. I'm going to die. No one's coming for me. And no one did come for me. Nobody jumped in the water and saved me. What happened was I felt this force underneath me push me up and over the edge of the pool. I mean, like more than half of my body was over the edge of the pool. And when I turned around, cause I thought maybe somebody swam underneath me and pushed me out. 
turned around, looked in the water. There was nobody there. And my and then I I, was, I remember I almost lost consciousness, and nobody was nobody was coming for me. And I just like, how do I go from being under the water to over the edge of the pool when it was so high? When I couldn't even touch the edge of it. I mean, it was so high. It was so like it defies physics or something. And I I know it's kind of. Barbara, I'm, first, let me start by saying that I'm, I'm glad you're safe. That's the most important. I really am. I'm glad that you escaped. Uh, how do you, how do you know it was uh, how do you know it was God and not perhaps, for, for the sake of argument, the ghost of uh, one someone on your family tree who died long ago, who was who was there, who came and lifted you out of the water? How do you make the distinction between one or the other? You mean like whether it was God or a loved one that they oh, saved me? The ghost of a loved one or some other force. Uh, how did you get to God? Um, this specific well, God with a proper name, to be honest. Jesus. Yeah. Uh, yeah. How, did, how did you get from... There was a force. There's something I cannot explain. And I found myself on the side of the pool rescued and alive, how did you get from the force to Jesus? Well, I I felt, like I said, I felt something underneath me, and then when I was out of the pool, I felt there was a presence there. It didn't feel like a bad presence. I felt, I felt like calming and relaxing, and, and it's, like I, it's like I knew. Okay, benevolent presence, I get that. I, How did you get from benevolent presence to Jesus? To Jesus. I don't, well, he, he made him, I know, I know it sounds kind of strange, but he made himself, he makes himself known to me, like, he speaks to me in my spirit, what? and I know there's a difference between, I mean, because there, there, um, a lot of Christians misunderstand your own thoughts, your own feelings, you think so, but it's actually just feelings in your heart, and, and then there's in your spirit, you have to decipher which one's is which, or you're just gonna think everything's really there when it's not. I um, I just felt like he was telling me it was him that saved me, cause and I I try I try so hard when I, uh, um later on down the line when I could actually swim I actually tried debunking that thinking it was just the force of the water that did it. I did everything I could to try to debunk that and I couldn't do it, so I just really believe that God was the one that did it. Because I was thinking logically. I was like, okay, no. maybe, huh? I, no, I get the impression. I, I, I understand why you're thinking this. Seth's point is, even if we were to accept the story, which, frankly, I, I have issues with, I believe, I'm, I'm willing to accept that you are honestly relaying the story as accurately as you can. But there's a number of variables. There's a number of things that don't make sense. There's also a number of variables involved, uh, especially if you're drowning and your, you know, your brain's being deprived of oxygen. How accurate you're going to be in actually remembering the events. But with setting all that aside, at the end of the day, you are convinced that something happened to you, something for which we don't apparently have an explanation, and yet you are convinced that the explanation is Jesus, because that's what you feel. Right. I, uh, now, if I, that's the case, mm -hmm. then you haven't, first of all, I'd say you haven't actually been presented with sufficient evidence to justify your conclusion. But then you have to answer right. another question. Right. And that is, you have to look at this from not just my perspective or an outsider's perspective, but, but this, you, you were in trouble and you asked for help right. and Jesus came and pulled you out of the pool. And then, right. and then provided you with no other evidence that you could relate to anybody. But he convinced you and made you feel that he was there and he was with you and it was, you said, unshakable, undeniable, unquestionable, whatever it was, uh, that this is the right. case. Why are you so special that you get this and nobody else does? I, I, I do, I asked, um, I asked God to him all, I, I um, well, I mean, you've done, I mean, he saved me other times from really quick. Okay, he's never saved me when I needed it. Why not? Right. And if you're in good with him, can't you just ask him and he can tell you? Actually, if you're in good with him, could he have not caught you before you fell in the pool? That'd be nice. That's a whole other thing, so. I've asked him. I've asked him plenty of times. Do, do you get any answers? 
Yes, I have actually gotten answers. What What are the answers? Well, the simple one that he would normally give me is, I love you. So he would... doesn't love me. I thought he loved everybody. I mean, he does. I think, to be quite honest, and I'm just going to be real with you. I think God mostly saves people if he has reasons to keep them alive. I, I know that sounds like something a Christian wouldn't say, but to be That's quite true. honest, I think God saves people only if he's going to use you for something. Okay. So, you know, <laughs> what's, he, what's he going to use you for? Well, I do believe that he wants me to um, spread his word around, be a witness. So he let you fall. He let you fall in a pool and nearly drown, so that he could save you, so you could tell people about the time you fell in a pool and almost drowned. Yes. God, what a dick! Yeah. What, what an absolute dick! If he wants people to know that he's real and exists, why would he have to nearly kill you and save you in order to get that message across? To be quite honest, I tell I think God is crazy. I tell him <laughs> you are so Trust me, I, I don't I don't cover it up. I, I hope he's not pretend, listening. Uh, I don't pretend I'm not. He's not getting in the endorsement I think he was hoping for. Yeah. Me. I'm also a little bit struck by the fact that you are now the survivor gone to share your experience with us, and yet your own Bible says in 2 Timothy that you are forbidden to teach or instruct us or exert authority over us in any way. The Bible has disqualified you because you are a female. The truth is, is that it is we, the atheists, who are giving you the forum that your own Bible and Christian faith has not. I thought um, that um, in the Bible, what was her name? Sarah? She's the queen, right? Or was it Bruce? No, that's Abraham's wife. It's Sarah. Oh. But, it, yeah, like, like God used this female to do something. Um, I mean, but, but you're not allowed to, you're not allowed to be this evangelist that you pretend to be. You're not allowed to go out, and at least in terms of half the population of planet Earth, you're not qualified according to God's New Testament law. So how do you reconcile that? I don't mean to drag the call on and on. I mean, I realize we need to move on, but I'm just curious. If the Bible mutes your voice, how do you, how do you jive that with being on the, the switchboard today? No, that's the thing. I'm a sinner. I don't always do what I'm what I'm supposed to do. <laughs> I'm pretty sure you're not supposed to call God an asshole. <laughs> it, it's not I the first do. time. I, not the first time. Yeah, I, um, I think that's the I, first commandment there. But I'm not. And, and the, uh, I, um, or actually, it's, uh, I got nothing I, else. I, I, got nothing. I do. I do love so God. He, here's the thing. I, what? Here's the thing, and I'll let you go after this, and, and you can think about this. Okay. You have to try to think about this and, and from the standpoint of does it make sense. So my temptation is normally to ask somebody in your situation, if you were God, would you operate this way? Would you uh, intentionally make it so that somebody's about to drown so that you could rescue them so that they could tell their story? I'm not going to ask you that question because you already acknowledge that you think that's a dick move to do. Yeah. Here's the better question. You think that whether, God, whether or not God's an asshole, he did this so that you would have a story to tell, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Why on earth would God give you a story that is devoid of evidence, that is completely unconvincing, and have you call into an atheist show to expose the fact that there's insufficient evidence? That this, that this shouldn't be convincing. Your God, not according to your model, not only dumped your ass in the pool and then saved right. you from it, but he did it to give you a story that cannot achieve the very thing that you think the story should achieve. You do have a point there. Maybe, maybe God doesn't want me to share it with you. <laughs> but you already did. I don't know, but you can ask him, and he can tell you, right? Oh, don't do that. Sure. 
<laughs> that was Jesus. He's he, very Jesus upset. is messing with very your agitated. So ask God what he wants you to tell the story. Ask God what he wants you to do with that story. Ask God if he has any message for us. And then you can go back and tell us what God said. I can do that. Thank you, man. I really admire you a lot. Thank you, Barbara. I appreciate it. I'm right here. I'm right here. What am I, chopped liver, Barbara? We are on track to hit a 1.5% growth increase by the end of the quarter. If we reduce executive salaries by just 5%, we'll get to the European market by 2020. Who is this? This is Tom. I own 34 shares. Invest like a boss for free with Robinhood. Let me ask you something. Do you think your car insurance rate is fair? See, here's how insurance works. The premium... Yo, so I'm about to go do some crazy shit today, yo. Literally about to go to the iron furnaces and melt some steel down and pour some um and pour some molds so there's a part of a uh, a workshop that's uh teaching us how to make iron casting and iron molds and so for the past couple of weeks, we've just been coming up with designs and using clay to uh, make our projects and our designs. Why are my nose hair? I need to get a nose hair trimmer. But uh, so all of our prep work is done. Uh, yesterday, well, you know, a couple of days ago, we uh, started busting up a lot of the material we needed. And today's the big day. And I'm running a little bit late, actually, because I just wanted to try to paint for a little while. So, um, I'll be in Scranton at the Historical Iron Furnaces, uh, working with the Keystone Ironworks. And, um, if you guys aren't on my Instagram, definitely uh, hop on my Instagram, because I will be posting some live footage. Oh, no, I can't. Not if I'm working around the iron. It's like, yo, no phones, no nothing. That shit's going to melt in your pocket. It's like 2,000 degrees. But, um... Oh, that's going to bother me. I'm about to ride out. Go to the iron furnaces, do this John Henry thing. Uh, I don't know how long it... The day is going to be, I definitely want to get back in here later on and work on this piece some more, fiddle around with that background and try to get those trees back there to look like they're actually pushed back with the light coming through it. It's looking good so far though. So, peace. Until next time.